All right, great. So, uh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get started. Let me know if you see any, if there's any problems. Um, so today, um, today we're gonna continue our discussion of uh, time-dependent time dependent perturbation theory. Sorry, I'm having some little problems here. And we've been talking about this already for uh, a bit. And so today, what we want to do is discuss uh, what happens when we have um, a harmonic perturbation. And basically a, a sinusoidal um, perturbation. So um, I'll call it this harmonic perturbation. And what that means is that the um, perturbation goes as sine omega t. And that's a really important case because this is what happens when you have light. And that was the original problem that even started this whole discussion. So today we're going to really solve the real problem that we've been leading up to all this time, which is this problem. We're going to say the, the problem that we want to solve today is I have an atom or a system with all these quantum states. I'm sitting in some random state. I'll call it the kth state. And then someone has a, a laser and they turn the laser on. at time t equals zero turn they turn it on turn on and then the question is um what happens so we want to know what's the probability that we jump up to some other level the nth state so what's the probability to be in the nth state at time t okay that's what we want to solve for today where this is light and um, we know that the wave function of the system is going to be can be written in this form, where we can sum over all of the states, and there's some amplitude to be in each state. And each state has a little wheel associated with it that's spinning, a phase, a quantum phase. Um, and so then, the probability to be in the nth state at time t. It's just going to be equal to the amplitude of CMT, the amplitude to be in the state M at time T. All right, so that's that's what we want to find. And so we went through this last time. Uh, we already did this already for the non-harmonic perturbation last time, uh, but I, you know, kind of want you to remember what's going on. So the idea. <clears throat> um, so then, um, you know, the picture that you should have in your head, I always like to draw this picture. We start in the kth state with some blob of amplitude, which is CK of zero squared equals one, a big blob of amplitude. All the amplitude is in the initial state, but then at some later time, it's spraying amplitude to all the other states. And we just want to, and that amplitude is building up in all the other states. I'll call that C N of T. And we just pick one. This one is the nth one. And we want to know what is that, what is that one? What is the amplitude in one particular state? Um, and so we know how to find it. Uh, we did our time-dependent perturbation theory, time-dependent perturbation theory. And we found that the amplitude in a random state, the nth state, accumulates. Well, it's equal to um, this negative i over h bar, the integral from zero to t, 
uh, and it's a integral of the of the of the Hamiltonian. The we have the uh, matrix element of the perturbation, which is a time-dependent perturbation, um, and we have a phase factor negative i e k minus e m t prime over h bar um, d t prime. All right, that's what we found, and and this part inside. Basically, this is the the time derivative of cm of t, and we're just integrating it. Uh, and so we can see that, and this comes from the fact that this time derivative, I want you to sort of picture it in your mind that what we have is there's sort of three components. We can we can rewrite this stuff inside the integral. I, I, I think it's 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 useful to write it like this, so you can see that it's e to the negative i e m t over h bar. Uh, asterisk uh, complex conjugate h prime m k of t and then e to the negative i e k t over h bar. So it's sort of like we can think of what's inside that integral as, as three phasers, wheels that are turning. This is a wheel, this one is a wheel that's turning at omega. Um, equals um, E M over H bar. The, the Hamiltonian itself is turning at some omega of the perturbation. And then this guy is a wheel that's turning at um, omega equals uh, E K over H bar. So it's really the product of these three wheels that are turning these phasers. And so that's sort of telling you uh, how much amplitude is going into or out of the state, the nth state. So that's a picture that's useful to sort of think about. And so <clears throat> for light, for light, then we can ask, you know, what is this H prime MK? Oops, this should be K. MK of T. And and we know because um, we have we have uh, because because we know that for, for light we have that the Hamiltonian for light is just equal to it's just going to be uh, we just it's just force times distance right force times distance and for light the force is going to be um, well, we, I mean, there's actually a negative sign in there, so that's a little negative sign there, and it's going to be it's going to be e the charge times the electric field uh, dotted into distance, but the electric field is time dependent, so the electric field has a sign omega t, and so we see that for light, then the the Hamiltonian is just going to be uh, e the charge on the electron or whatever charge it is dot r the distance vector times sine omega t okay and so then we see then that this matrix element h prime m k is just the matrix element that's connecting the final state phi m and we have the the h prime and the initial state phi k of t and so we can see that this h prime um m k oops let's get this just want to get all these terms to form correctly is equal to we can write this as um phi m and then we have e E naught dot R phi K times sine omega T. So we can write, so when we're talking about this factor that goes into the integral right here, that factor, it has two parts. It has the 
the time independent part, I'll just call it h prime mk, and then it has the sine omega t, where for this matrix element has no time dependence. I, I just want you to see we've taken the time dependence out of the matrix element. Um, okay, and so this is the thing that's going into this integral. Um, and so, and so I'm going to keep this notation. I'm just going to call this, I'm just going to use this H prime MK notation, but I want you to see that this part is time independent. And it just depends on the electric field amplitude and the, the operator R. Okay, so so now let's so now we can write that that term, and and we can see that what we have to find. So then the the probability to be in the nth state is going to be this amplitude squared to be in the nth state, and this amplitude is just accumulating, and it's going to be this the integral of of these factors that accumulate from zero to time t, and that's gonna be h prime mk, which is that thing, times sine omega t prime, uh, which you can see kind of comes from that thing, um, and then will be times e to the negative i e k minus e m t prime, over h bar and those are those those wheels those phasers that are spinning dt prime okay so we just have to solve this integral uh, and then we get it uh, so let's let's do that let's go for it and solve that integral and and this should look kind of familiar it's the same integral we solved last time the only difference is that we have this sine omega here this is the new part. Because last time, in the last lecture, we solved this exact integral. We did this whole thing. But the only thing that's different is that we got the sine omega t is sitting there now. And that's due to the fact that the light is an electric field that goes up and down, you know, boing, 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 boing. So we have to take that into account. Okay, so, so now we got to do this integral. And the sine omega t just adds a little bit of math, but it's not, it's not too hard. Um, because we, we can just, to do this integral, you know, integrals are always easier if they are uh, exponents. So let's turn this integral into an exponent and then life becomes uh, a lot easier. And so we'll do this. So the, it's zero to T and we have our, our H prime. Um, actually, I'm gonna take that part out of the integral because this part has no time dependence. So he can come out of the integral so I'll take him out, uh, h prime mk. I still got my integral from zero to t, and now I got my sine omega t, and I'll turn that uh, into an exponent using the old trick for sine. You guys all know this. We know that sine omega t can be written as e to the i omega t, t prime actually, minus e to the minus i omega t prime so long as you divide it by the 2i so you guys all know that it's just a little way to uh to expand sine but it's actually really important for this problem because we're turning the sine omega t into these two we're basically taking the sine omega t and we're turning them at the sine omega t into two complex phasors spinning in opposite directions i want you to see that like this is now a phasor spinning in one direction and this is a phasor spinning in the other direction. And so that's kind of interesting. You might not, ever, might not have ever thought of that before. The light wave, which is this real electric field that's just a sine wave going up and down and up and down, we can think of it as two complex phasors, one going clockwise and one going counterclockwise. And the reason why I emphasize that is because the one going clockwise causes absorption and the one going counterclockwise causes emission. So this idea of breaking this, 
the sine omega t into the two complex phasors is actually very important for understanding the physics. Um, it's kind of cool. I mean, you, you've probably never seen it before, and so it's, it's kind of cool the first time you've seen it. Uh, and so then we have a, it's cool because it's freaky and weird. And most physics majors like freaky, weird stuff. Uh, EK minus EM on T prime over H bar, T prime over H bar, uh, D T prime. Okay, so I've just written out that, that integral. Um, nothing, nothing fancy, just, just, just doing the math. But then let's multiply it out. Let's keep going. And it looks complicated, but it's not. It's just tedious math. But it's so we're just we're just gonna multiply it out. Just do some algebra. Oops. Getting phone calls. Sorry about that. Um all right, so let's multiply it out. Uh and then I have um negative one over uh 2h bar, uh, h prime mk, integral from 0 to t, um, we'll just multiply out, ek minus em minus h bar omega, t prime over h bar minus e to the negative i, uh, K minus E M plus H bar omega T prime over H bar D T prime. Okay, so you see how the integral has broken up into two parts. And in one part, I think of the perturbation as a phaser going clockwise, and in the other part, the phaser is going counterclockwise. So it's these it's these two these two parts. One's going clockwise and one is going counterclockwise. I might get those directions mixed up, clockwise, counterclockwise, it's one or the other. Uh, and so, okay, so, so that's, that's the amplitude to be in the nth state. And, and, and so, um, so what, we, what we can do then is let's, let's solve the integral. And when we solve, and so now there's there's two integrals to solve, so let's solve them, but they're easy because they're exponents, easy. Um, and so we can just write down the answer. Um, uh, so if you just, and I'm gonna skip a line of algebra, but you guys could do it. It's pretty straightforward. It's just integrating an, an exponential. You can see it's possible at um, integral. So we have that matrix element out front, but now we have two, two terms. And the first term is gonna be e to the negative i ek minus em minus h bar omega t over h bar uh, minus one divided by uh, e k minus e m minus h bar omega. But then there's another one here. And this one is going to be e to the negative i e k minus e m plus h bar omega t over h bar minus one divided by E k minus E m plus h bar omega, and that's it. So that's the that's the answer. Okay, after we do the the uh, the integral, and it's it's a pretty ugly answer. So when you look at that, it doesn't really give you any physical intuition the first time you see it. Uh, I mean, it didn't at least didn't for me uh, when I first saw it. But but it's possible. But but if we but let's mess with it a little bit to to understand it. So the, to understand this big messy expression, because because we've done it. You know that that's the answer. Um, 
And I mean, we could just we could just write down the answer and because we know that P M of T, the probability to be in the M state is just it's just this amplitude is just the square of this thing. But in order to understand this, Joshua, I need you to get out of here right now. Don't come down until fall. <clears throat> All right, so in order to understand this thing, then what we have to do is uh, the first thing to remember is that the frequency is positive, all right? So the frequency is always positive. Um, and so then um, what we're gonna notice is that there are two important cases to consider. So we gotta break it up into two cases. And in one of the cases, what we're gonna have is that the final state is greater than the initial state in energy. And that's this situation where we have um, this kind of a situation where we're going up in energy and that's called, and what is that physical process called? Can someone tell me? Excitation? Yeah, that's one word for it. Uh, that's right. But another word uh, is absorption. And we can also call it stimulated absorption because it's the absorption is happening, it's being stimulated by the light. But it's, but people, but often we don't use the word stimulated, we just say absorption. That's absorption. Um, and then, um, but then there's another important situation where I have um, um, EM is less than EK, in which case we have this kind of a situation. Where I start here and I go and we go down. And so now the final state is lower in energy. So this is another possibility. I have both of these are possibilities. And so this one is called stimulated. Can someone tell me? Emission. Exactly. So these are the two situations. And, and here, and when we look at this ugly expression that we derived, what we see is that there are two, uh, the two, the two cases are living in this ugly expression. And let me explain, because this is all happening simultaneously. Because the way to think about it is that, you know, this is what's happening. I got my atom, I mean, I'm sitting in some initial state K, but there's all these other states. And if I shine the light on it, then it has some probability to go up, but it also has a probability to go down. It, it has a probability to go to all of these states. So it's all happening simultaneously. Um, but here uh, we can break, but we can break it into these two cases. Um, and so let's take a look at this. So, so here, the thing, the thing to notice is that for case one, I'll call this, I'm gonna call this the left side and this is the right side. And which one of these is, which one of these two expressions is bigger for situation one? And which one is bigger for situation two? So let's start with situation one, which is the stimulated absorption. I'll call that situation one. Which of these two expressions is bigger for situation one? Somebody tell me. Which one is bigger? Here's a hint, look at the denominator. Don't look at the numerator, look at the denominator. Mm 
Which one is bigger, um, the left one or the right one? Would, would it be the right one since the denominator is smaller? Yes, that's exactly right. Yes. So I'll put it here. One. Absorption. And then in the reverse situation, this side is bigger. Two. I'll call that emission. And that's really important. And that's why we break it up into these two, these two situations, because in the case of absorption, so let's do, in the case of absorption, we only worry about one side, and in the case, and because the, because one side dominates the right side, but in the case of emission, we only worry about the left side. So we only worry about one or the other, depending on whether we're talking about absorption or emission. That's sort of a key point. So let's talk about absorption first, which means that we're going to only deal with that, which means that this side dominates for absorption. And for absorption, we're going to, we're going to keep this. So we're, and we're going to kill the other side. So let's consider absorption first. Absorption. Then we're going to keep the right side of that equation and we're going to drop the left side because because the right side is much bigger than the left side that's why we can do that so that's what we do for absorption so for absorption what we have then is um we're going to have c m of t the amplitude to be in the nth state so now let's do absorption and this is absorption is that we're going to uh we're going to go up in energy, in which case the amplitude to go up is going to be negative 1 over 2i, uh, h prime, the matrix element connecting the two states. Um, then I have that exponent e to negative i, e k minus e m, uh, plus h bar omega t over h bar uh, minus one e k minus e m plus h bar omega. Okay, so this is just the, I just took the one side, I just took the right side, okay? It's just this side. I just want you to see that. And so, uh, and we're ignoring the other term. Since here, I'm gonna have, um, since um, I have, E k minus e m less than zero. All right, and so now we just have. To, so now that's what we want to do is we just want to square it. What we want is the probability, right? And the probability is just that thing squared. But before squaring it, we're going to do a trick, a little math trick. And the little math trick is that we're gonna we're gonna pull out a factor. So here's the little trick, the useful trick. And I did it already last time, I think, uh, but let's do it. We're gonna, let's, we have this, we have, uh, we have, we have C M of T is equal to negative one over two I, same thing. But now we're gonna pull out a factor. And this is the factor we're gonna pull out. We're gonna pull out this exponential factor. Um, plus h bar omega times t, but we're gonna divide by two, two h bar. So that's the trick, it's a math trick. And so that means that the thing that's left behind in order for it all to work out, the thing left behind has to look like this, e to the negative i, e k minus e m, plus h bar omega uh, t over two h bar, minus e to the negative i e k minus e m but uh get all these factors right so plus and then this will be t over 2h bar 
divided by ek minus em plus h bar omega. Okay, so that's it. So it looks worse, but it's but it's it's the same. This is the same CM of T. I want you to see that. So the, these things are the same, but I just did a math trick. I just pulled out that exponential factor. I hope that you guys can see that. If you can't, you know, ask a question. <clears throat> but, the, but the reason why we do it is because now what we can do is we do the squaring. Now we will square it. But when, you, but when we square it, you can see what's going to happen. This guy is going to turn into what when we square it? <clears throat> can you guess? One. Exactly. And the reason why we pulled that out, this guy is going to turn into what? This numerator is going to turn into what? Just sign. Or exactly. That's right. The, yeah. Sign. It'll be sign of a big mess. That's why we did this math trick. And so that means then that what we get after doing, after squaring it, <clears throat> is that uh, it's going to be h prime m of k magnitude squared times sine squared em minus ek minus h bar omega t over 2 h bar all over em minus ek minus h bar omega squared okay so this is a this is the big climactic moment so this is the answer i'll put a box around it and so um okay so so this is this is our answer and so this is basically the probability to find ourselves in state M. At time T. Okay, and so this is really important because this is this is basically what we're saying is this is the situation we have we we have these states we're sitting in the k state and we have the m state and we're, we've just found the probability for this process to happen and so this is basically the probability to absorb a photon. So we've we've absorbed the light, although I I want to say that um, in this treatment the field the the electric field is classical in this treatment. So so there are no photons. So we don't really have photons in this treatment. If you want to see photons, you're going to have to go to graduate school and learn field theory. Where you have photons but here this is a classical field but i just want you to understand that physically that's what's really happening we're absorbing a photon and we're jumping up to a higher energy um and so that's a really important thing and and i also want you to, to see something else which i think is 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 not very intuitive the first time that you see this which is that the um uh, when you when you look at this you realize that um well, I'll ask you, I have my final state and I have my initial state. And, and here's a question, do they have to equal, does the, dis, does the difference between the final state and the initial state have to equal omega, h bar omega? Does it have to? Yes or no? Um, it's... I guess like, are we like accounting for stuff like 
hyperfine splitting and stuff like that? Because if we account for that, then it wouldn't equal, right? No, it, it all, I mean, we're just, we just have energy levels. And so everything is already taken into account in the energy levels. So yeah, let's not worry about hyperfine, all that. I mean, we have the mth level and the kth level. We have the initial level and the final level. We know their energies. They are EM and EK. But I'm asking you, the question I'm asking you is, does the difference in energy between the initial and the final levels, that's the initial level, that's the final level. So I'm asking you a very fundamental question. Does the energy difference between the initial and final states have to equal the frequency of the light? No. Right. It doesn't. It does not. And so that that's sort of not, I mean, the first time you see that, I, I, I found that kind of surprising, you know, the first time you see it, because you've been learning all your life, you've been learning that this, you know, in quantum transitions all your life, you've been learning that um, the, the energy difference of the initial and final state is the frequency of the light, right? You jump up, <laughs> but you, but if, but here, I just want to say sometimes these energy differences are equal to the H bar omega. And we call that resonant absorption, but other times they're not equal. And so I just want to make the point that, that, light at one frequency can cause an energy transition at a, at a different energy difference. The, the energy difference does not have to equal the frequency of the light. And that will, is what Professor, we call off resonant. Can yeah. I ask a question? Um, of course. Should we have plus uh, H bar omega in the numerator denominator for using the right hand side term? Uh, let me in see. Our, in our answer, because otherwise, if we had the EM minus EKs equal to H bar omega, then wouldn't we get a zero in the denominator? Wait, EM minus EK is positive. I think um, I think that makes sense though, right? Because our sine sine it's this is sort of like sine x over x, which is which is has a resonant frequency at oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. zero, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I think I did it right. I think this is the correct expression. I, I, did, I guess I didn't quite understand your, say your question again. What, what was it, or, or is it, are you okay? Yeah, I think I might just got a confused in the math somewhere. Okay, okay. But I think that this is a correct expression. Okay, so now let's take a closer look at this expression. Um, well, okay, but first let's just very quickly do uh, the second case of emission. And so for, let's do emission really fast, which is where now EM is less than uh, EK. And let's consider emission, where now I have EK here and EM here, and I go down. Okay, let's do emission. And so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the um, CM of T, is equal to the left hand side up up high. Remember when we went, you know, all the way up here, where the heck was it? Yeah, now we're gonna do this left hand side. And so um, and for this case, the, the left hand side is much bigger than the right hand side. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna say that the the amplitude to be in the M state is approximately equal to the left-hand side up, up above. And so that means that CM of T is now, I can write the left-hand side um, and it's just gonna be uh, one over two I times H prime MK and it'll be now E to the negative I uh, EK minus EM minus H bar omega T over H bar minus one divided by EK minus EM uh, minus H bar. Okay, and so then we can just do the, then what we can do is the same math as before. This, we can use the same math trick that we used above. And that then allows us to write uh, the answer 
at C M of T amplitude squared, the probability to have emission, to emit a photon, um, is going to equal the, uh, uh, the matrix element squared times sine squared um, E K minus E M minus H bar omega. I'm in trouble with my omega. Um, times T over 2H bar divided by K minus M minus H bar omega squared. Okay, and so this then is the probability to emit a, pho a, pho a photon. Probability to emit a photon and to fall down in energy. <clears throat> and um, what I want you to see is um, if we say, what I want you to see is that this is basically the same formula. It's the same formula as absorption. And so the two processes are symmetric. It's a symmetrical thing. They're, they're both happening symmetrically. And so let's define the energy difference as a positive number. Let's just say that there's this positive number, which I'll just say is the absolute magnitude squared of this difference, EK minus EM. So now I don't have to worry anymore about, you know, if it's a negative number or a positive number. Let's just take the absolute magnitude. And if I take the absolute magnitude, then I can see that uh, both of the equations can be written Essentially, I can say that the probability to have either emission or absorption is equal to this matrix element squared times sine squared of this energy difference minus h bar omega um, times t over 2h bar over delta E minus h bar omega squared. And this is a very nice way of writing it because now you can see that, uh, you, can, you can see that nature prefers resonant processes. So professor, I have a question. Um, yeah. If we try to understand this in terms of like, conservation of energy then um, when you're not in when you don't have the energy of the photon equal to the energy of the transition how do we understand where the remaining energy sort of goes um, if you really want to understand it in terms of um, well well first there is, I mean, there are no photons in this treatment, and so, and so, it's not. Uh, there is no remaining energy. Do, do you see what I'm saying? It's more like, it's more like there's yeah. a. It, it's more like I have a perturbation, and the perturbation is like the you know the E charge times electric field dot R times sine omega t. So I have the electron, and it's being pummeled by this perturbation. The perturbation is, is pushing, it's pushed up and down and up and down, and then it makes a transition. So there is, uh, so there is no leftover energy, you know what I'm saying? Because what you're assuming is, uh, is photons, you know, you're already making the assumption that there are photons. Now, so in our, in our treatment, that, I, that problem of energy doesn't really occur because it's just a perturbation causing a transition. But I still think but but in, in reality, we really do have photons. <laughs> so so your question is a good question. Um, and so a nice way to think about it is this. Check it out. Um, the perturbation is this. Um, uh, H prime of t, if I write it as a function of time, it's sort of like it turns, this is t equals zero. It, it, it turns on and then it turns off at 
T. Okay, this is my, and this is my perturbation, but notice that my perturbation is actually, it's a, um, uh, what's the word for it? A wave train? I can't remember. A pulse. It's a pulse. It's a pulse of light. Okay. And so you'll notice that um, if I take this pulse of light and if I were to look at the power spectrum of that pulse of light, power uh, as a function of frequency, then you'll notice that that this is, if this is my, my dominant frequency, omega, the, the frequency of the light, you know, the wiggles. <clears throat> but, but notice that I've, I've created a train, I, I turned it on and off. If you take a power spectrum of that, you're gonna see this. Right? Aren't you? And this will be omega. Yeah. And then this will be, um, I guess I, you know, this is a little bit funny. I got to have, I got to parameterize in terms of T prime and omega prime. But if I do a, and this is a power spectrum omega, oh, this is so tedious getting the math correct. Um, but I think you see what I'm saying, okay? So the point is that by having a pulse train, by turning my laser on and off, you think like let's say I have a red light, you know, let's say I have a laser pointer that's red. You think you think, oh, I'm shooting red light, red photons. I turn my I turn my laser pulser on and off. And you think, oh, I'm shooting red photons, you know, my friend. But actually you're not. You're shooting mostly red photons because these guys would be, you know, at omega. But you're also shooting green photons and yellow photons and blue photons, not just not so many, but you see what I'm saying? By simply turning the pulse on and off, you cannot turn a pulse on and off without having higher frequency components. And so if you get worried about, and lower frequency components too. So if you start getting worried about energy conservation, just remember that your perturbation has all frequencies in it. And just pick the one that satisfies energy conservation and then, and then you should be happy. Did that make any sense? Okay, so it's, yeah, it's sort of like, um... If you look at it from the perspective of the individual photons, then it has to like transition by that amount, right? But it's just that we don't always have photons with the same frequency or the same energy. Well, yeah, your pulse, your pulse is composed of photons of, of all frequencies. There's a, but there's a dominant frequency. You know, the resonant frequency is dominant. There's a dominant frequency. So, you know, nature prefers the resonant processes. Because they dominate, you can see they're they're dominating in the in the Fourier transform, uh, and so you can see that. It, basically, I want you to see that CM of T uh, is bigger for uh, delta E equals h bar omega. In fact, let's plot it. Okay, let's let's start being let's plot it. Plot. C M of T. Let's plot it. And when we plot it, let's plot it as a function of um, let's fix time and uh, let's plot it as a function of um, delta E. And when we do that, it looks like this C M of T squared. Um, let's put it like this. It's right here. Um, this will be omega. This will be delta E. And if you plot it, then you see it looks like this. All right, so that, that's the function plotted. Not so good at drawing it, but, and so you can see that, um, that it's, it's biggest at, at the resonant frequency. You see, if I just plot the function, you can see that the, the resonant process dominates. Resonant process dominates. 
meaning when delta E is equal to H bar omega, then that's when CM of T is a max. It, it's a maximum there. And, and I also want you to see that it has the same property as before, that the width is shrinking and the, the top is growing at t squared. The, the width shrinks as 1 over t and the, and the top is growing as t squared, just like before. The, because this is the same function that we had before. Notice this is the only difference in this function is, is this h bar omega. We, we remember we plotted this already for delta e. And so, but this was, for, we did it for the constant perturbation. Now we're doing it for the harmonic. And the only difference is this h bar omega term. And so, uh, so here we're, we're plotting the function. Um, and you're seeing that this is the, this is the resonant process right here. So when, so it's a maximum when delta E equals h bar omega. But, and so this is, so these are the resonant process, but then there's also off resonant processes. So both occur, both can occur. Okay, so now let's, um, let's take this a step further and let's, let's consider um, something, let's, let's, take these, these, let's take these ideas a little bit further and let's ask ourselves, um, what happens if we have um, this situation? Let's talk about um, the photoelectric effect. And the photoelectric effect is the situation where the um, h bar omega is greater than the bound state energy. And, and that might, this equation might look funny, but I'll, I'll show you exactly what I mean. This is the situation for the photoelectric effect. Suppose I have this situation. And I know you guys have all thought, have all thought about the photoelectric effect like in physics 7c. So here, I'm sitting in this state, okay? And, you know, I want you to know that, you know, EK is a, it's a bound state, so that means it's, it's less than zero, and this is the zero. So when I draw these boxes, you know, for, for an atom, the, the top is always zero energy. And so that means that this is a bound state of EK less than zero. But now, what happens if I shoot in, um, if I have a laser beam, but now h bar omega is greater than the bound state energy. So that means that, that this is h bar omega in energy, h bar omega. It takes it right out of the atom. And so then the question is, what happens? How does this process occur? What, how do I think about it? And I should actually say, I could say, let me say it this way. What is the probability what is probability uh, uh, to, to make the electron free, uh, to shine in the light and make the electron go free? I'm free. What do I call that process? Somebody tell me. Ionization? Yeah, exactly. What is probability to ionize the atom? I'm free. Oh, I've been bound for so long, but now I'm free. So we want the electron to be free. And so what is the probability to ionize the atom? So let's talk about that. And in this discussion, we will discuss um, Fermi's golden rule. This leads to Fermi's golden rule. That is the answer, is Fermi's golden rule. Have any of you heard of Fermi's golden rule? Yeah, although I, I learned about it in a scattering context. Ah, uh, yeah, we will do that also. That's interesting. We will do that when we talk about scattering. We will discuss it in the scattering context also. Okay. Um, that's funny, though, because this is where most people learn it. But yeah, there's, you can learn things in different ways. Uh, okay, so let's do that. So let, let's actually, so, so here's the thing. 
um, let's look at this process. So, you know, we're we're shining a, la a laser on this atom, and the electron is stuck in some initial state, kth state. <clears throat> the laser has h bar omega, but h bar omega is greater than e k, so it, it sends it out into these energies above zero. Now, <clears throat> energies below zero are quantized, you know, because these are bound state energies. And you always have some box that's pulling you down like a proton. The, the, the Coulomb potential of a proton is like a box and you quantize the levels. But if you're free and you get out of the box, then then there's no box and so now the levels are well i'll ask you the question are they quantized what is the energy spacing of the levels for energy greater than zero it's continuous that's right we have a continuum and you guys studied that last last semester you might not remember so well but you did Right, so for positive energies, I have a continuum of states. I can still think of myself as being in a box, but the box is so big that the quanta, quantization is, is itty bitty, tiny, tiny. So it's a continuum. So now what we do is we, we shoot this guy up to here. This is h bar omega. But th that's the resonant process. But the thing is, is that there's, this is the state the resonant state at E K plus H bar omega. So that's the resonant state, meaning what you would get if you just shifted by H bar omega. But we also know that there, you can also have off resonant processes. So when that electron gets shot up, it can go to this level, but it can also go to this level or this level. Or this one, or this one, or this one, da, 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 da. and it has to go to this one, or this one. It can go to any of these levels. You see that? One level is resonant, but the others are off resonant, and it can go to any of them. Off resonant. And so, um, if I want to know the probability to ionize, what do I have to do? Can somebody tell me what, what strategy should we follow? sum over all of the like exactly that's exactly right the probability to ionize at some time t is going to be equal to a sum over all the final states um all final states and the probability to be in all those final states and i'll use the same terminology that we used before that's that same amplitude that we just calculated a few minutes ago. So I have to prob I have to sum over all possible final states. But what and 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 this but what is this function C F of T? It's the same function that we just derived. It's going to be this. It's going to be this this function. Um, uh, it's going to be h prime uh i have my final state my initial state squared and then i'm going to have sine squared i'm going to have the energy of my final state minus the energy of my initial state minus the energy of the perturbation divided by t over 2h bar divided by the denominator ef minus ek minus h bar omega squared all right and so that's the probability and so this thing and and this thing is a is a function so i can actually draw it here so i could this is a, a nice way to draw it i can draw it like this because here what i'm drawing is cf of t squared this is the probability that the electron goes to any of these states is, is this function that I just drew. And so um, 
I have to sum over that function. And so what I can, but but what I wanted, but what I can do then is I'm going to do a, a trick, a math trick. And what we can say is that the probability to ionize, what, what we can do is here, let's go back up here and you see how I have a, I have a sum. I'm, I'm summing over these discrete states, but I can turn this into an integral. It's gonna be an integral over what variable? Can you guys guess? I'm going, I want to go from a sum to an integral. F. Say it again. F. Yeah, the, the final energy, that's right. It's going to be a sum over the final energy. And so I can just, I, it can be this. It can be C F of T squared summed over the final energy. That's right. Um, over all possible final energies. But to go from a discrete summation to a continuous integral, there's one thing that's missing. At every energy, I have to know what? Does anybody know this? This might be true. The degeneracy? That's right, the degeneracy, exactly. How many states there are at that energy? And what do we call that factor out, out in the real world? The density of state? That's right. We call it the density of states. R rho of E F, where rho of E F is equal to the number of states per energy. So that's how you turn from a sum to an integral. You you have to you have to know the degeneracy at every energy, and that degeneracy we call the density of states. Okay, so. And if you, uh, so I think you've all seen this before in some class, like in physics 7C, you guys did density of states. We, we need it here. So the probability to ionize then at time t is going to be equal then to this, this integral. Um, it's going to be, um, actually, let me give myself some more room to write it. Write the integral. It's going to be probability to ionize at time t is going to be equal to this integral um, h prime of f k, the matrix element of the light connecting the initial and final states, and sine squared of e f minus e k minus h bar omega divided by um, shoot, I forgot the h bar divided by e f minus e k minus h bar omega squared times the density of states at every final energy at every possible final energy okay so i'm integrating over all possible final energies and so the thing is is that this is the function this this is a, a this is a peaked function. This function is peaked at um, E F equals E K plus H bar omega. It's peaked. I know that it's peaked at the resonant condition. And so as I go away from the resonant condition, the energy uh, the, this function falls off fast. And so what that means is that it's okay for me to integrate here from negative infinity to positive infinity. Just to make the, the integral easier, I do that, but it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm basically, this is my integral, and back in this picture, I'm integrating over this energy. This is gonna be the plus, the plus up and down. And so this, this, so I'm gonna call this negative infinity to positive infinity. And that's, it's a little bit, it's sort of cheating, but it, it, it's okay because the function falls steeply. And so the function, the integrand is zero far away. So it's okay to integrate over that and just makes the integral easier. So, um, so this is the integral that I got to do. And because this is peaked, 
at e k plus h bar omega, then even though this function might depend on energy, I can pull it out of the integral and I can evaluate it um, only at e equals e k plus h bar omega. Because, because this is a peaked function. So that's a math trick. So I'm pulling that matrix element, even though it's energy dependent, I can pull it out of the integral because the integrand, that other part is peaked at a particular energy, right? You know, because this, this integrand looks like this. It's, if I plot it, you know, it's, it looks like this. And it's peaked at um, h bar omega, and this is delta E, right? You know, we, we plotted it before. So uh, I can just pick this, this energy. Um, okay, so that means then that my, my ionization probability is gonna be equal to, um, and I can also pull, oh, and by the way, I can also pull this out too, because I know that EF is approximately equal to the initial state plus h bar omega and so um, so i can pull those two factors out of the integral and then i can write the integral um, like this um, i have a, a density of states factor in front and that's at, evaluated at at the initial state plus h bar omega energy and i have my matrix element which is evaluated at that same energy. Um, but then I have this integral that I got to contend with. And this integral is sine squared of uh, EF minus EK minus H bar omega T over two H bar all over EF minus EK minus H bar omega Ah. Okay, so that's the that's the thing that I got. So th this is the hard part, but it's not that hard. But we got to deal with that integral. So let's do it. It's it's very famous. It's a very famous integral. And and maybe before I do anything, I'll just just say uh, just remind you what h prime f of k is. That's just going to be uh, my final state at e k plus h bar omega, and then then I have my uh, my h prime of r, my perturbation, the time independent part, and then that's my initial state. And this, of course, is going to be e e naught dot r of the laser basically the amplitude of the laser beam. Okay, and so now let's do this integral. And to, to do this integral, we'll do a math trick. And the math trick is a change of variables. We're gonna define a new variable u is equal to that mess inside there. Uh, professor? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if this is valid, but like since you're um, kind of taking EF to E equals to EK plus H bar omega, um, wouldn't that wouldn't that angle be small or something? Wait, you said angle. Uh, we're talking about I'm energy. Sorry, sorry. That that energy in the in the argument wouldn't it be small? So you could use like a small angle approximation. Uh, yeah, maybe, but, uh, I'm just going to do it this way, the way, you know, there's like a, let me think, the small angle approximation, would I give us the right answer? Do, 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 do. Yeah, actually, that might be a nice way of doing it. Uh, but, but I'm going to do it, uh, I'm going to do it even more precisely than that. So, so let me, let me just keep going. So let's make this. <clears throat> Let's, but, but that would be a way of, of moving forward, and that would probably give you a pretty good answer, but I'm going to show you a way that you can get an even more precise answer. So let's let u is equal to EF minus 
EK minus H bar omega T over two H bar. So we'll just let U equal that, just a change of variables trick. Uh, and then we have um, VEF, the, 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 the thing I'm integrating over, if I do the little calculus trick, DEF is then equal to two H bar over T DU. And we also can see that the denominator EF minus EK minus H bar omega, that this is the denominator part squared is equal to uh, four H bar squared over T squared U squared. And so let's plug that in. And when we plug that in, what we see is that we get um, that the probability to ionize at time t is equal to the density of states at that energy plus h bar omega. Um, the, um, the matrix element connecting the initial and final states and this integral infinity to infinity of sine squared u divided by four h bar squared over t squared u squared du all right i'm just plugged in so i, I mean i'm skipping some algebra but it's very simple algebra you guys could all do it uh, and then and then what we have then is we see that this is equal then to um, Rho of EK plus H bar omega. I've got my matrix element, FK squared. And then I have T over 2 H bar. And then I have my integral from negative infinity to infinity of sine squared U over U squared. D. Okay, and so this is a really cute thing because. Now we have this famous integral. And does anybody happen to know what this integral is equal to? Does anybody know? Is it I just, um, yeah. never mind. Well, here's a trick. If somebody ever says, here's a famous integral, what is it equal? Then what you can always say is E. One pi. <laughs> it's always one of those. And in this case, it's one. pi. <laughs> good, good guess. <laughs> pi. But but pi and one are pretty close. So if you had said one, that would have been a pretty good guess. Uh, so it's equal to pi. So if, if anyone ever asks you what a famous integral equals, just say pi. And five out of six times you'll be right. Um, okay, so we plug that in. It's a famous integral that you just look up in a book somewhere, and then you get this, um, then you get this very famous result, which is that uh, the the ionization, the uh, probability to be ionized at time t is equal to rho e k plus h bar omega, the final state energy, times the um, the matrix element squared, times pi over 2 h bar um, times t. Okay, and that because you have this t here. And that's the famous result. But, but this is a bit of a weird result because you'll notice that the probability change, the probability is linear in time. And so the first time you see this, it's kind of weird. And so basically the way, to, the way to think about it and visualize it is that here's my atom and I'm sitting in the kth state, the initial state. All of my amplitude is there. Remember that picture of the amplitude, CK of zero squared is one. I got all my amplitude sitting in that state. Then I shine my light on it, and where my light is bigger, has a bigger energy. And so basically what you do is you look at your resonant level up here, uh, 
E final is equal to E K plus H bar omega. And the way to interpret this result is that the amplitude is siphoning itself up here and this amplitude is growing with time. You see, it's a, it's growing. The amplitude is growing and it's growing linear in time. And so this is a linear flow of amplitude, linear flow, linear in time. So the flow, so the, the amplitude to be in that state is flowing. Or actually I should say it's the probability that's flowing. The probability is flowing linear. So we have a flow, a linear flow of probability. And, you know, before you took quantum mechanics, that might, might seem really strange to be talking about flow of probability. But, but in quantum mechanics, it's quite normal. It's natural because remember, it's the amplitude that's flowing. The, the Schrodinger equation is basically just an equation that tells us how amplitude flows between levels in a system. And, and, and so that means if amplitude is flowing, the probability is flowing. And so the probability uh, flows linearly. And, and so what that means, that's very special because that means that the more, the natural thing to think about is the rate equals probability per time. And so let's just divide it. So let's consider this new quantity called the rate and we'll call it the transition rate. is equal to the probability per time. And that then is equal to this, um, this very simple answer, rho of E k plus h bar omega, h prime f k squared pi over two h bar. And so this is the very famous result. And this is Fermi's golden rule. Fermi's golden rule. And, and this is really important because it's telling us the rate of transitions. And so the way to think about it is, is that I'm starting in, in, in my initial state is CK of, is, is, this is my initial state initial and so initially you can think of at t equals zero all the probability is in that initial state probability equals one but then if i actually that's not what i wanted to try all the probability is in that initial state but then at some other time t equals t naught then, and, and if I look at some final state, P, my final, the probability to be in my final state is zero. There's no, no width to it, no probability. But now at some later time T, you can think of the probability is now shaved off. And this amount of probability is T. And so the amount of probability here is one, but now it's one minus delta. And now this probability has moved over to the new state. And so this is amount of, because I want you to think of probability as stuff. So the probability is flowing into the new state. And so then the number, and so then the number of transitions per time is simply equal to delta over T naught. Because suppose, as an example, suppose that delta is equal to one uh, fifth, probability of one fifth, point two. That, and suppose that T naught is equal to three seconds. So what that means then is that if delta equals one fifth, and that means that my rate of transition is equal to delta over T naught is equal to one fifth of a transition every three seconds. 
And so that means my transition rate is equal to uh, one over 15 um, per second. All right, and so and so that is the natural units to think of this process. It's the it's the probability per time, which is equal to a transition rate. And when you first see this for the first time, it's kind of confusing. I think I found it confusing. It made no sense to me, but that's why I'm sort of trying to draw it like this. I want you to see it's a this this idea of thinking of a probability rate is a very natural thing. It's just the oozing of the probability from one place to the other because the prob because the probability carries with it the particle. So if 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 one fifth of the probability goes to my state, that means that the prob that the particle has a one fifth chance of being in that new state. So that means that the transition is one fifth per time, whatever that time amount is. And so that's how we think of transition rates. That's how. So when I shine light on atoms, that's how electrons jump up. There's transition rates. That's all just how the probability oozes. The, the laser beam comes in and causes the probability to start flowing from the initial state and it flows to these other states. And, it, and, it, uh, and for this case of the photoelectric effect, the flow pattern is linear. There's this funky linear flow, uh, which depends on the density of states of the final state and the matrix element. Okay, folks. Uh, uh, professor? Yeah, yeah. I just had a question. Sure. Um, that equation that's boxed right there? Yeah. Um, if you take the inverse of that, like flip it, is that like the time for all of the, like can you think of that as a time for all the probability to be in that upper state? No, no, you would think of that as the time it takes for a transition to occur. Because like, I was just thinking like, if you make probability of T, that numerator on the, in the middle, um, if you make it equal to one, meaning um, the probability of being in the upper state is just one, meaning it's 100% there, and then you take the inverse, then um, it, wouldn't that give you like the time for all the probability to switch over to the next, um, to that upper state? It, it should, it's, no, because you, you have the number of transitions per time, and so the inverse is the time per transition. So that's how much time it takes for a transition to occur. Because if I have if I have one fifth of a transition per second, then if I take the inverse, that means it takes five seconds for one transition yeah. to occur. So that's how you interpret the inverse. Okay, like, folks. Okay. Yeah, because I gotta stop the recording. Okay. Okay. Okay, guys. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I'll see you later. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye.